Beloved congregation, please turn with me in your Bibles to, this time, the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, and I'd like to read verses 18 through 20. This is found on page 1543 in the Pew Bible. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age." Dear congregation, I want you to imagine yourself at at a baby shower uh, or an engagement party, and you are surrounded by a pile of presents. Uh, It's an exciting night. There's all these gifts, all your friends and family are there, and you are going one by one unwrapping these gifts. And and there's lots of useful things. Um, There's the blender, there's all the things that we typically get at these types of parties. They're there. And then you open one box, and you say, oh, thanks, and you're thinking, hmm, what on earth is this? I'm not really sure what it is or how to use it. And so when you get in your car, you maybe talk to your husband or, or whatever, and you say, well, what is this one gift? Uh, any, any clue what it is? And, and he doesn't know what it is. He doesn't know what they're going to do with it. So you get home, put it back in its box, and you put it in the attic as a piece of furniture to collect dust. In congregation, I fear that's what many of our relationships is like with baptism. Baptism is one of the precious gifts Christ has given to his bride, the church, and yet it seems to be one of the most unused or misunderstood gifts that we have. We have the gift of Lord's Supper, and many of us understand how I use that in my Christian life, how that strengthens my faith, and yet then there's baptism, and and we just leave it in the box. What do I do with it? Well, that's not right, because baptism is a gracious gift of Christ, and it's meant to be used. And, And by used, I don't merely mean, although it includes this, I don't merely mean pulling it out of the box when there's a baptism service. Now, we should do that. The the present is out of the box again today because we have a baptism service, and that's great. As as I see the baptism then, if I've been baptized, I should be making personal applications. I'm not just thinking of of the child that's receiving this or the, the person receiving this. I'm thinking personally, this gift was given to me for me to use. So we need to use it at a service like this. But Jesus never intended this gift to only be used once every couple months. Uh, This is one of those great practical gifts that's meant to be used like your coffee pot or your Keurig. uh, At least once a day, maybe multiple times a day. The, The same is with baptism. It's a gift that's meant to be used multiple times a day in the Christian life. And so whatever side of the baptism debate, if you want to call that, you know, our brothers and sisters who are believers, Baptists only, whatever side of the debate we're on, this personal question has come for all of us. Am I using the gift Christ has called me to use and has given me to use in my Christian life? Now, to help us understand what baptism is, so that we can use it rightly, we've been walking through the baptism form. And last time, uh, it was a number of months ago, We looked at the first portion of the form under the title of spiritual washing. We saw there the need for cleansing. Remember Ezekiel 36. Um, But today we want to consider the second section. And let me read it again. It's just a short, short section. It says this. Second, baptism signifies and seals to us the washing away of our sins through Jesus Christ. For this reason, we are baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
And what I hope you'll see by the end of the sermon is the key relational family language that maybe you missed when we read it. So our title of this sermon is Welcome to the Family. Welcome to the family. We have two points. The first one is the naming ceremony. The naming ceremony. Now, uh, children, the, the naming ceremony, it, it's a special time where a person, a baby, is officially assigned a name. Now, we probably don't have an official type of ceremony like that, that you know, we make this official event and, and we declare the name. But we do have a Bible story where that happens. Uh, we typically read it around Christmas time. You remember the story of the baby in Elizabeth's womb? And then she has this baby, and her husband at this time, um, Zechariah, was, was mute. He couldn't speak due to his own unbelief. And, and so this baby is born, and, and you can picture the scene. All the family is gathered around. The baby's born, and the family comes in, and they say, hooray, it's a boy. Junior is here. Junior has arrived. We'll call him Zechariah. And, and Elizabeth says, no, 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 hold on. It is a boy. But his name is John. And you remember, no one believes her. Uh, they think Elizabeth's joking. Uh, Elizabeth, there's no one in your family with that name. What are you talking about? His name is John. And so they don't believe her. They don't believe the mother. So they go to Zechariah himself and, and say, what's the official name? Give us the name. And Zechariah can't speak, but he can write. And so he writes, his name is John. And Luke 1, tells us everyone was amazed. But that settled it. From that day on, the baby was called John. Now, beloved, I just said we don't do naming ceremonies, probably. But we actually do. And that's what baptism is. Baptism is a naming ceremony. And the name we receive is not just a name like like Kipton. That's not what I'm talking about. But the name that's pronounced over us is the name of the triune God, Father Son, Holy Spirit. That's what our form says. We're baptized, notice, into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this, of course, is coming straight from the Great Commission, which we just read here, Matthew 28, verse 19. It would be helpful to turn there if you, if you have your Bible open. Matthew 28, verse 19. We see it coming from the lips of Jesus. Verse 19, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, before we unpack what this means, we want to remember the significance of this moment. Here is our Lord Jesus Christ announcing, or you might say, declaring for us the name of God. And in the Bible, God's names are very significant. A key part of God's self-revelation is his name. And so in the Old Testament, you, you might know that God made himself known to his people as Lord. And in most English translations, it's Lord, all capitals, Jehovah or Yahweh. And that is God's beautiful covenantal name, this name of relationship, a name that God didn't give to the Philistines to use. He didn't give to the Moabites to use. He gave to his people to use. Call me Jehovah. And what an awesome thing that is. He was telling his people, you don't need to merely call me God, this generic term for God, but use my my first name as it were. Lord, you can speak to me on a first name basis. You can use my relational name. And so what a privilege. And children, do you remember what the scene was when the Lord first explained that name, when he first declared or announced that name? It was, remember Moses was, was in the wilderness, he's tending the sheep, and, and he sees this bush that's burning, and, and that's not very odd because, you know, it's a hot desert, it's dry bush. But as he looks at the bush, it continues to burn and it burn and burn, and it doesn't get consumed. And so he approaches it, he walks closer, and suddenly the bush starts to speak. Well, the Lord speaks through the bush, and the Lord there announces his name. He explains his name, and you remember, it was a sacred moment. Moses, take off your shoes, for you're standing on holy ground. 
And it was there that the Lord pledged to be the redeemer of his people. He was going to deliver them out of Egypt through the shedding of the blood of the lamb, the Passover lamb. Once you have the Passover blood shed, then you'll have an exodus. You'll be delivered after the blood has protected you. And so the name Jehovah or Lord, it was always then associated in the Old Testament in their minds with the great redemption that came through the exodus. Well, here we are at the end of Matthew's gospel. A gospel primarily originally written for Jewish people. And God here has redeemed his people. Finally and fully. The real lamb, his blood has been spilt. And that's already happened earlier in this gospel. Jesus has risen from the dead. And right now he's about to ascend into heaven where he's going to pour out his spirit on his people. And yet it's here at this moment that we find him teaching us who the Lord, who the Jehovah is. It's this second significant moment, the second moment where, where we're, we're standing on holy ground, as it were, and the name of God is being announced. It's being explained. And listen to what Jesus says. He doesn't say, just call him Lord, Jehovah, that beautiful name, which we can still use, but now call him Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what an awesome thing this is. Uh, John Owen, the Puritan, states that here in this verse, we see the full doctrine of the Trinity in seed form. It's in seed form. Notice the text says, uh, Jesus says, one name. There's one name. It's singular. Baptizing them in the name, not names, but in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. There's one name. There's one God. There's one nature, one divine nature, one being. To God. And yet, this one God is three persons. The singular name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Not three gods. They're, they're not one third of God, but each divine person mysteriously possesses the full essence of God and yet is distinct one person from another. So, congregation, what a moment! What a moment. This is a high water mark, you might say, in the Bible, in terms of revelation. What, what a moment. The glorious God in the person of Christ is giving a fuller revelation of himself to his creatures. Uh, this is significant. Everyone should stop and listen and worship. Here is the transcendent Lord, the holy God, who's made everything, and yet he's making himself known. I want you to know me. Friend, do you know this God? Do you know this glorious, holy, transcendent one? Do you know your maker? The one who easily spoke all things into existence. Do you know him? Or are you ignoring him, living as if he doesn't exist? Uh, It's so easy for us to be impressed with humans. Uh, We see the great nations and, and we're impressed. We see the great businesses, the great companies, we're impressed. We see the great leaders, we're impressed. They're nothing. Here is one worth being impressed at. Isaiah 40 tells us that the nations, the mighty nations, are nothing before this one. They're a drop in the bucket. He he could kick that bucket over in a second. We're dust on the scales. And so, friend, do you know this one? This powerful one? Have you ever stood in awe and wonder at, at at his power, at his might, Has it ever given you a sense of your nothingness? And yet, as we understand that, as we seek to understand that, as we seek to know this one, look at what he does here. This is amazing. The the, the transcendent one is also the imminent one. He is the close one. He is the one who's near. And, And beloved, here's the amazing thing. In our text, God is saying, I want you to bear my glorious name. He stoops down to us and to our children and he says, you get to wear this name. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. What does this mean? Well, God is is putting his name on us. This This is an act of ownership. He wants to associate himself, the holy God, 
wants to associate himself with us worms and ants. This is almost too much. He wants this. This is his design. Um, If you're a farmer, then you know a lot more about farming than I do. Uh, If you have cattle, you brand them. Maybe, I think. You put your your name on them, don't you? Why? Because they belong to you. That's me saying, I own this one. I'm going to provide for it. I'm going to feed it. Right? I'm going to care for it. That's what God's doing. I'm branding you. You're wearing my brand, my name. Baptize them into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Baptism functions like that. Uh, it's this initiation rite or ceremony. It's, it's the ceremony that says, you belong to my covenant family and my church. Now, notice the name is being placed upon us. Uh, it's not something that necessarily changes us within but it's, being, it's a name being pronounced over us. Uh, just like, remember that scene, Zechariah pronouncing the baby's name to be John. Nothing changed internally at that moment, but something changed externally at that moment. Now his name is John. And that pronouncement has lifelong significance, lifelong effects. John was going to go through life always thinking of himself, not as Bob or Fred, but as John. I'm John, and he couldn't think of himself as in any other way. Baptized one, do you live that way? Do you live that way? Whether baptized as an adult or a baby, do you live with your baptism functioning in a way that it impacts the way you think about yourself, your identity? We've been baptized in the name, into the name of the triune God, And so I shouldn't then, if I have been, I shouldn't then think of myself apart from that reality. Uh, This is who I am. God's name has been placed over me. Now, to use an illustration, baptism then is, is something like the birth certificate. It's like the birth certificate. It reminds us of who we are. Now, children, you probably, I think you all have birth certificates, but you probably don't pull them out. And that's a good thing. But just, that's just like we don't pull out our baptism record. We don't, we don't need to pull out the record every day. And yet every day, though you don't pull out your birth certificate, every day you live in the reality of the fact that you are born to your parents and you have a certain special name that they've given to you. That even whether you think of your birth certificate or not, that's just the reality in which you live. You live in that world. And that's then the function of baptism. I don't, I don't need to check the record books as it were, but I need to live in the light of of the reality. But let's get more specific to clarify what this means for us. And first of all, I want to explain what this means for the believer and then for our children. And and we have to follow that pattern. Our form follows that pattern. And and I fear as reformed people, sometimes we, we, this is where we go wrong, I think. We just think about baptism in terms of our children. We hear baptism and we right away think, okay, that's great for my children. And that's not reformed thinking. Go to the institutes and you'll re- find John Calvin does not talk first about infant baptism, but he has a whole chapter, a long chapter on baptism. Baptism and what it means for the believer. And then only after I've understood that, then I get to infant baptism. And that's because the reformed have recognized this pattern of scripture. Uh, I've reminded you of this story before, but it's, I think it's so key for us to grasp The story of Abraham, it's something Paul brings up here in Galatians 3. Uh, Genesis 15, Abraham believes in the promised coming Christ, so Galatians 3 is referring to that event. Uh, Verse 6, he believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who's coming, the Messiah, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. That's happening in Genesis 15. And Paul here in our chapter, Galatians 3, tells us Abraham then is justified the exact same way that New Testament believers are justified. Believers have always been justified in this one way, through faith alone and Christ alone. That's it, always. But remember the story of Abraham, what happens? So we have believing Abraham, and then we, in Genesis 15, and then we get Genesis 16. And believing Abraham has a faith crisis. Years have passed, and he's starting to doubt God. 
Where is this child? Where is the child you've promised? This one that will lead to the Messiah. Where is my coming Christ? And so he takes things into his own hands. He takes Hagar. And he has a child with her rather than through his wife, Sarah. And then you get Genesis 17. And that's the chapter on circumcision. And there, in God, God in his kindness sees the weakness of Abraham's faith, says, let me give you something to strengthen your faith, something that will help you believe the promises, not a wedding gift to leave in the box, but something that every day you will think about to help your faith be strong so we don't have another Hagar incident. It was meant to be used. Romans 4, 11 says, he received the sign of circumcision a seal of the righteousness of faith. Not a seal of his faith, but a seal of the righteousness of faith. Who is the righteousness of faith? Jesus Christ. That, that was the point of this, this picture and pledge. It's, it's to point him. God is saying, Abraham, I want you to be more Christ-centered. I want you to see the circumcision and see the righteousness of the coming Christ. I want your faith to be strong. And so I'm giving you circumcision. Well, believers, we live on this side of Christ's shed blood. We don't need any more shedding of blood. Circumcision is done away with, but God has given us a sign and seal that replaces it, baptism. And believer then, first of all, for you, your baptism is meant to strengthen your faith. It is a precious gift of God. But in particular then, what does your baptism preach to you every day in light of this first point? It says this. Every day, your baptism preaches this sermon, Christian, believer, you belong to God. You belong to God. You've been irrevocably branded with his name. Uh, He will never push you out of his family. That's the message to the believer. I've just sinned. I've just fallen on my face like Peter has. I've just denied my Christ. Have I been pushed out out of my father's family? God's saying, take up your Bible. You'll find promises that say no. Take up your baptism in your mind, and you'll find promises that say no, and they're the same promises. Christ, his faithfulness. And I want you to function then with your baptism pointing you to your Savior. And so believers, there's a question for us, and it's this. Is our faith really so strong? And are we really so put together that we can afford to keep this gift buried in the attic? In the attic? Is our faith really that strong in ourselves? No. We can't afford to do that. We won't live the Christian life well. When our fears and doubts come, my baptism preaches a sermon to me saying, run again to my father. Run again to the one who cares for me. Anxious Christian, overwhelmed Christian, stressed Christian, have you been using the gifts, the tools that your father has graciously given you to help your faith? Pull it out. Remember it in your mind. This is who, this is who I belong to. And he won't, Push me away. But then, there's something shocking that happens in Abraham's story, and it was shocking for Abraham. In Genesis 17, God doesn't just give Abraham this sign and seal that points to the righteousness of his Christ, but he says, give that spiritually packed sign and seal to your kids, to your children. I want them to be branded too. And that was totally unexpected for Abraham. And and yet, what an awesome gift for the believer's child. Well, what's the message for them? Children, it's this. Your baptism tells you that you are claimed by God. You are claimed by God. Now, of course, in one sense, everything in this universe is claimed by God. It all belongs to him. The cattle on a thousand hills belong to God. The birds in the forest belong to God. And yet, children, in a special way, God has come to you before you could go to him. 
And he says, I'm laying my claim upon you. I will be your God. I want you to wear my name. I'm the gracious king. I'm setting you part, apart for myself. And, and so children, what this means is that you have been lovingly, lovingly summoned to live your whole life in relationship to the best king in the universe. He lovingly has come to us. And, and he's saying, I want this to be a part of your identity. God has open arms towards you. And he's saying, welcome. I want you as part of my family. You are set apart for me. That's the meaning of 1 Corinthians 7, 14. When Paul says, our children are holy. Not talking about some internal holiness, our our moral purity, but the word holy means set apart. They've been claimed. Old Testament, New Testament. They've been claimed. They've been reserved. They have a special covenantal relationship to God. And so young people, God's name is on you. God's name is on you. And you are responding to that reality one way or another. The Lord tells us in the third commandment, you shall not take my name in vain. And there's a lot more to that command than just this, but there's at least this application. Do not despise my name. Do not treat it as common. My name is upon you. And by turning your back on me and living as if I don't exist, you are despising my name when I've opened my arms to you. So the naming ceremony. Second, there's another ceremony, and it's the wedding ceremony. This is our second and final point, the wedding ceremony. The title of the sermon, Welcome to, my fa- to the Family. I, re- I remember that being spoken to me uh, quite vividly, it was uh, spoken on the lips of my father-in-law. He was at the wedding uh, reception following the ceremony, and it was in his speech, he, after asking me, do you promise to love and care and look after my daughter, waiting for the answer, and after giving it, he said, welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. And, and that's the other picture in baptism, marriage. 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 Notice it in our text here in, um, in Matthew 28, 19. Literally, so our translation says, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But the literal translation is baptize them into the name. And that's why our form says into the name. It's recognizing the Greek there, that there is a, more, a better, more precise translation of this word into and it's this this whole picture then of of union and of intimate relationship we're baptized into the name of the father the son and the spirit now what's interesting is as you go through the book of acts you'll find the apostles baptizing people and one thing that's odd is that you don't find them baptizing people into the name of the father the son and the holy spirit what are they doing they baptize them into the name of Jesus. Have you ever noticed that? Acts 2, 38, Pentecost. Peter's preaching, baptized into the name of Jesus. And you go through all through Acts, into the name of Jesus. And you say, are the disciples still a bit thick? Have they not got it yet? Uh, they should listen to Christ and then do what he says? No, they're not disobeying a command here. This is Luke's way of highlighting how a sinner can be connected to the triune God. Baptizing into the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is shorthand as baptized into Jesus. Christ is the mediator who bridges the gap between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's the one, the person of Christ, who who brings together sinner and the triune God. And so over and over again, we find in the New Testament, Paul describing baptism as a picture of the believer's union with Christ. And that's what we read in Galatians 3. Galatians 3, 27, baptized into Christ. And so the Spirit has led then the believer to believe in Christ. We have received Christ, and now we're united by Christ. And this whole picture of union with Christ, uh, it's one of the illustrations of it is marriage. Ephesians 5 uses that marriage illustration Uh, And what a picture. Just like a husband and wife, uh, the two shall be made one. Believer, that's you and your Savior. 
That's you and your Christ. You are one with him. You are united to him. And so here's the other illustration then that baptism is like. Not only like a birth certificate, but it's like a marriage certificate. A marriage certificate. Or maybe even better, it's like the wedding ring. The wedding ring. Why, why do we get these? Are, are they just, you know, a good salesman out there and it's a money grab? Maybe. But they're more significant than that, I hope. Uh, my wedding ring, it, it tells people I'm, I'm reserved, I'm claimed, you back off. It reminds me of my relationship to my own wife. And beloved, that's the application for your baptism as well. Believer, your baptism reminds you of your relationship to Christ. There's nothing more practical, nothing more necessary in the Christian life than this. Satan wants you to forget Christ, your husband. He wants you to forget all that Christ has done. He wants you to leave the gift in the attic collecting dust. That's Satan's desire. But Jesus says, I want you to know your relationship to me. I want you to remember that we are united. As you think of yourself as a baptized person, that reminds you Jesus is real. His love for me his real, is real. Our marriage together, Christ and his bride, it's real. Jesus really represents me before the Father. He really lived. He really died for me. Uh, he really washed me. For my sins, though they're filthy, though I see them again today after I've stumbled and fallen, he has really, truly washed me. He is my righteousness. These are the thoughts that our baptism ought to be promoting. And so what a joy. What a joy our baptism is intended to put in our hearts. It's not a useless gift. It's not something that has no value It's given to you so that you might rejoice in Jesus Christ. And don't you need that? Don't don't you need more of, of this standing close to the cross, standing close to the empty tomb? Your baptism helps you do it. It helps you to reckon yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Your baptism reminds you that the Father sees me in Christ, and so he thinks I'm beautiful. He sees the robes of righteousness. But more than just being my representative, Jesus is my life. That's the other part of union. It's this vital living union. And my baptism reminds me of that. I don't have strength in myself to live in this world. He is my strength. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And Paul would say to the Galatians, remember that promise, memorize that text, and think about your baptism. Because they point in the same direction. Now what's the application to our children in this picture? Well, this takes us to the final big question that I want to have us answer in this sermon. And it's the question of our text, Galatians 3, 27. And maybe it's a question in your mind. Because Galatians 3, 27 says this, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And in terms of the believer using his baptism, you might say, okay, I get that. But does this mean that being baptized automatically unites you to Christ? Is that what Paul is saying? No, absolutely not. That would contradict Paul's own experience in the experience of the early church. Just think of Acts 8, and you remember Simon the sorcerer. He's baptized. He receives the sign, the seal. He's baptized, and yet he did not put on Jesus Christ. So that goes against Paul's own experience, and it goes against Paul's own teaching. But let's frame this verse in in another way. Imagine Paul said, as many of you as were circumcised have put on Christ. And Paul says that to the Galatians. As many of you as were circumcised, you've put on Christ. And then someone reading that says, Paul, haven't you read your Old Testament? Many received circumcision and clearly weren't believing in Christ. And Paul would say, of course. But I'm not talking about the outward sign merely. I'm talking about the spiritual reality that this is pointing to. Romans 2, 28. 
He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, Paul knows this, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter. So Paul could say, he who's been circumcised in the heart has put on Jesus Christ. And with that understanding of Paul's view of the covenant, we come back to this text and see those who've been baptized, spiritual reality, have put on Jesus Christ. So what does this mean for our children? Well, it means, again, that it's possible to be a covenant child and to have received the sign and seal of the covenant and yet not to have put on Jesus Christ. The Bible is clear. This chapter is clear. You're not a full adopted child of God until you come to him in faith. Notice the verse right before, Galatians 3, 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Faith is required. If, and so, children, if we're not believing, if we're not using our baptism in the sermons we hear, in the Bible we, we read, to believe and to respond to this God, then we are rejecting him. And greater punishment awaits us. The Bible is clear. Hebrews tells us it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And it is fearful after we have been given, given so much and so many reasons to believe. And so children, what's your baptism for? And parents, how can we help our children use their baptism as a gift instead of as a stumbling block? Well, here's what baptism is for. Through your baptism, dear children, God wants to remove all all your excuses for unbelief. That's what he's doing. He's saying, why would you stay away from Jesus? I've come this close to you. He's perfect for you. I've showed you you're a sinner. You need to be washed. I've showed you the blood that does wash. So why would you stay away? Come to him and keep coming to him. Just think, Jesus says to everyone who hears the gospel, to everyone who hears the gospel, come unto me and I will give you rest. That's awesome. But Jesus comes to you, children, and he blesses you, meaning he wants you to know his posture towards you. And he's placed you in a home where you have believing parents, and he's placed you in a church that tells you over and over again, come to Jesus. And that's what your baptism is calling you to do. Rest in Christ. Believe on Christ. Put on Jesus Christ. And if I might quote one of my favorite Baptists, John Bunyan, come and welcome to Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing Psalter 125. One, two, three, and four. Psalter 125. 